Hello, I'm Kriakos Gold, and welcome to Think Greek. When we designed these sessions, the world was a very different place. We were planning to celebrate the 200 years of the Greek Revolution in very creative ways. And then lockdown happened. As Melbourne is opening up, we are hosting four sessions here at the Greek Quarter at the Commons QV, and we will talk about politics with John Pantazopoulos and Dean Kalimniou, women with face preterian Vicky Papachristos, arts with Esther Antolitis and Helen Marco, and society with Viv Nguyen and Nikos Papasteriadis. So join us every week for interesting discussions on multicultural lessons from the Greek Revolution of 1821. In this episode, we're going to talk about politics with John Pantazopoulos and Din Kalimniou. And I, I honestly don't think that, you know, Greek, Greece would have happened if it really wasn't for um, predominantly um, the Greek diaspora who helped drive these initiatives that found the friends in the Philippines. I think that there were vast amounts of different Greeks, so diverse that you can't even put a label on them. My gut reaction when the question was asked who was for and who was against the Greeks is to say no one. The church starts changing its, its position, but it can't formally change its position until there is a Greek state. And even now, you know, we're still working through, the patriarch is still working through what is its role in the success of the Ottoman Empire being the state of Turkey. You know, that's clearly still a problem. Bubulina was assassinated because her son had the temerity to uh, marry the, um, the daughter of a leading land baron on the island of Hydra. Mando Mavrogenos has uh, devoted all of her family resources to equipping ships for the Greek Revolution. Her love life was uh, paraded um, for all to see. She was, uh, it was, I'll call it, she was slut shamed, yeah. Welcome to Think Greek. We're going to talk about a revolution. John, where did the idea of independence stem from? Well, I think the, the principle of freedom is an intrinsic human value. We all, we all sense what that might be for us individually, and that's why small communities like villages first start. If you look at the settlement before the cities, it's small communities get together, people feel free, they're, they're empowered to make decisions. But of course, people are impacted by what happens around them and they're impacted by desires of other individuals that see themselves as being, their areas of interest being free, they're impacted by rulers, they're impacted by um, uh, hierarchies and oligarchies and, uh, and wars and, and famines. But the idea of the Greek Revolution, I think, just really stems from that sense of freedom. I don't think that they all saw themselves as a, a part of an, a continuity of ancient Greece. Uh, we saw that there was a continuous resistance, basically, since Byzantium fell um, against the Ottoman rulers. Um, and that succumbed to a certain point in time, where in 1821 they were successful eventually because of a number of other things that were happening all around them. So both the American Revolution, the French Revolution after that, the ideas that came out of that, uh, um, uh, liberty, uh, egalitarianism, fraternity, um, which was really imposed on the, on, on the Greeks externally. Maybe some felt that, those merchants that were internationally connected felt that. But a number of things were bubbling along that led to Greece's independence. All these things are correct. You're coming from a place where, from ancient times, laws, how people govern each other, the correct way to deal with each other, the, uh, the way that you live in the city and relate to other people, these were all things that absorbed the ancient Greeks. Uh, they also were taken on by Rome and absorbed by the Byzantines. So when you get a deprivation of a whole civilization, the Greek people are very conscious that they've lost something. Also, they're getting treated as second-class citizens. The legal regime under the Ottomans was not particularly favorable to the Greeks. It was a very difficult time, which means that there's only so much of that you can take before you decide that it's better to go on your own. And when you go on your own, it's under the uh, belief that at least if you are ruling yourself, there will be some type of equality there. And equality is the key here. Because if there was equality, they would have been quite happy 
to be subjects of the Ottoman Empire. There wasn't equality because equality was confirmed by religion. They had to go their own way. And there were a number of factors, as John says, um, including the revolutions that were going on around them. But for me, most importantly, was the Ottoman society itself. The fact that, for example, people like Ali Pasha, who ruled most of modern day Greece, decided to go it alone. And he was an amazing man because he was a Muslim, so part of the hierarchy, but he was the first Muslim ruler to confer equality upon his subjects, at least substantively. He didn't discriminate against you uh, by religion. He was a tyrant, you had to do what he said, but under his court, uh, most of the uh, freedom fighters of the Greek revolution were trained. Uh, the court language was Greek, so that was the first actual uh, experience of governing in modern Greek was imposed by a Muslim ruler. So they had experience of governing and a taste of how it would work if you were governing yourself, an idea of how to organize militarily, and then once uh, he led a revolt against the Sultan, when he, was, when he was gone, there was a precedent set. We know we've got the skills to go it alone. When you're talking about equality, are we talking about equality of rights or equality of money? Were people poor at that stage? Well, look, I'm talking about equality in terms of advancement. The glass ceiling in the Ottoman times was, gen was uh, gen uh, generally religious. There were certain occupations that were only open to people of a certain religion and others that weren't. He didn't care. He would advance you if you fulfilled his needs. Didn't, there was no discrimination depending on what religion you were. And that was a major, major difference because that was a completely different worldview to what everyone was used to. John, what's the connection between the French Revolution and the Greek Revolution? Is there a connection between Europe and Greece at that time? Well, there is, you know, that period, that period of enlightenment and which, for their own purposes in Europe, they'd rediscovered back from the ancient Greeks. So, so the connection is really through the Greek merchants who were well-connected, who'd been educated in the West, who started putting those ideas back in Greece, financing education, so you know, education provides you opportunities, raises awareness. The impact of the American Revolution and then, then, then France not long after, uh, those ideals, the ideas of fighting against um, empire, and even though this interesting contradiction that empires survived in Europe, but the Ottoman Empire collapsed, that was sort of more of a convergence again of, well, someone else's empire collapses, someone else's empire increases. Um, that was being filtered through into, um, uh, into, into Greece, particularly through the, through the educated and, and, and trading merchant class. Um, they helped resource and finance some of those things that, that otherwise would have been called rebellions. Uh, they, they ended up supporting and financing revolutionary uh, efforts. They had ties with what became later, as we know, as the Philolines, who took an interest in this, took an interest in the round their own development as nations. They were using this ideal even before Greece existed to help improve their own countries that were monarchies and empires and raise their own standards. So the issue of, of being equal changes over a period of time. You know, I mean, what we think of equality now is very different than what we thought 100 years ago or let alone 500 years ago. So we just happen to be in the right place in the right time around the need for them to improve their systems and they were having these debates, you know. They, you know, when we look at the British Parliament, they were radicals and the Whigs and evangelists. Uh, they were very different to the Conservatives. The Conservatives were happy with the same order. The Conservatives were really happy for the Ottoman Empire to be there and these troublesome, rebellious Greeks, um, you know, were, were, were a bit of a nuisance um, uh, uh, disrupting, the, disrupting the norm. So those ideas filtered through and there was, and I honestly don't think that, you know, Greek, Greece would have happened if it really wasn't for um, predominantly um, the Greek diaspora who helped drive these initiatives that found the friends in the Philolines that worked the system to get the publicity and to get the, the discourse going on in the West, using other examples of revolution around the world that were going on. Um, tying in this, you know, nasty Ottoman Empire, this Islamic world, um, the atrocities it was doing when it saw resistance really anywhere in the empire. Um, it was easy to focus on that to help the discourse that was going on in the West. So these things filtered through and, the, and with the training that was referred to and the British also trained through the Commonwealth of Ionia, um, people like Olokotroni, those skills were there that then eventually um, 
it all filtered through and this crescendo of these things crashing together um, led to a successful revolution, which of course you know, took nine years before, um, before those Western powers recognised Greece until 1830. So were there two kinds of Greeks? Were there the Greek merchants and the diaspora that had the money and the education and the Greeks that lived in the Ottoman Empire that was not so educated or not, or should I say, more vulnerable? I think that there were vast amounts of different Greeks, so diverse that you can't even put a label on them. There were Greeks who didn't speak Greek, whose predominant language was Turkish. There were Greeks who, sp who spoke a form of Greek on the Black Sea that no one else could understand. There were merchants. There were uneducated Greeks. There were educated Greeks. There were slaves. There were heaps of slaves. Yeah? Um, there were people in the diaspora who made it big, and there were ones that were struggling. What the did diaspora. the revolution mean for those people? What did it mean to a slave? I mean, freedom would mean a totally different thing well, this for is, those two different this castes. This is the thing. If you look at a country like Russia, vast amounts of money were raised to redeem slaves and captive women. And that's the story that we don't tell. One of the stories we don't tell is about the women of the Greek Revolution. Yeah? I mean, we talk about our heroines and how great they were and how they gave money so that they can build ships and go off and fight. But what about the slaves, the ladies? And I mean, if you read the, uh, the memoirs of freedom fighters like Makarigianis, the freedom fighters themselves gang raping Greek women. Yeah? Uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, rubles being gathered in Russia, uh, pounds in Britain to redeem slaves. Because you can't enslave a Muslim, but in those times you could enslave a Christian. That was permitted. And these people are languishing. They have no rights. They, they cease to be people. Um, so yeah, diverse number of people doing diverse number of things, not just merchants, uh, diaspora and Greeks and non-diaspora and Greeks. Uh, people who come from mixed marriages, uh, people who have a different sexuality to what the stereotype uh, of what a Greek revolutionary should be uh, actually had. All of these things are things that need to be taken into account of. I heard you both speaking about foreign powers. So who was on the side of the Greeks and who wasn't? Well, like all things, you know, the powers that be basically hold back. So if we have a look at what's happening around the world, different spheres of influence, we call them countries nowadays, but maybe there's movements, you know, if you look at Afghanistan, you know, different tribal groups, different religious groups, they find a way to resource and promote their, 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 own, um, uh, their own agenda um, in, the, in, in those areas. So the ideas of those Philolines and the Greek merchants, you know, were supported by, you know, we, we, the, the, you know the, the biggest revolt was the, the Orlov revolt supported by the Russians. Um, that, that really showed that a re revolution in Greece was even though it failed and it was, you know, immense reprisals, it showed that there is potential that eventually this place might change. So the powers that be, so Battle of Navarino, start seeing, well, you know, again, this convergence suddenly means they've got to, they've got to make a decision, right? So countries in the end have to make some decisions. They're, they're either going to sit neutral, they're either going to be against or they're going to be for. And the smart movers, the early movers are those that can help shape and influence, because when you look at after Greece is set up, empires don't collapse. You know, the modern st state of Greece is not even what we know now. It removes, you know, as, we've, as you know, Dean keeps on saying in all his lectures, you know, the, 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 the Ottoman Empire is replaced by influence of the superpowers. But practical reality means that you're not going to do it unless you're supported. And we saw that in the Asia Minor catastrophe when internal Greek politics takes over international agreements with the powers that be um, that led to their withdrawal of support, which meant that the Greek army you know, was left to evacuate without support. And we know what all the answer of, of, of all of that is afterwards. So we're in the right place at the right time again. My gut reaction when the question was asked who was for and who was against the Greeks is to say no one. Because everyone seeks, as John says, to dominate. And the colonialist paradigm is one whereby, and the orientalist paradigm is one whereby the modern Greeks are demeaned, whether that's by the Philhellene movement which presents Greeks as unworthy descendants of the ancient Greeks in order to demean them, their capabilities in order to dominate them, which is what happened. And then it asks the following question, which is, well, 
We're talking about a revolution which is supposed to have led to an independence. Did Greece ever truly become independent under the, uh, the tutelage and control, if you like, in inverted commas, of these world powers? Where isn't that the $64,000 question? That's what, Greeks, yes, that's what is. Greeks were talking about during the global financial crisis Absolutely. as well. And even now with 1821, um, the uh, celebrations are muted. Yes, because of COVID, but also because there's this sense that, well, are we really celebrating something which is true? What was the role of the church in, in, the, in the sense of politics? As we're, as we're moving towards building a constitution and building a nation state, what was the role of the church? And I'll go to you, Dean. Yeah, the church's role is a complex one. And the reason why is because the church is considered by the Ottomans as the only legitimate representative of the Christian people within the empire. So the Orthodox Christians. The Patriarch of Constantinople is the only representative, officially recognized representative of the Orthodox Christians of whatever nationality. Now, clerics were the only people who were able because of proximity and because of opportunity to retain literacy in the Greek language. It's very hard to have schools for many periods of time. Later on that changed, but for a big chunk of that uh, Ottoman subjugation, the clerics were the only people that were keeping the language and the literacy alive. And that was important because it creates a sense of otherness, alterity, creates a sense of identity. But mediating between a superpower which can destroy you and also trying to attend to the needs of your flock when these interests are conflicting is a problem. So you have a situation where as soon as the revolution breaks out uh, and the patriarch finds out, he's put under extreme pressure to denounce the uh, revolutionaries, which he does, and he, ex he excommunicates them. Regardless, he is killed. Between 10 to 30,000 Greeks of Constantinople and uh, Smyrna on the, on the uh, Aegean coast are massacred. The next patriarch of Constantinople is also killed. Something like 19 high-ranking clerics are killed in reprisal. So there is a um, school of thought that says, well, the church were collaborators, they were against the revolution, they were not invested in Greek independence. I don't think that's true. I think that the nuanced position is that the church was stuck between a rock and a hard place, trying to mediate between saving people's lives because they knew what was going to happen by way of reprisal, uh, as well as making sure that they, don't, uh, that they survive as an institution. But you have clerics who fought in the ranks of the revolution. Um, there are people like the Bishop of uh, Old Patras who raised the banner of the revolution in the Peloponnese. You have people like uh, Papa Flesas, who was a uh, cleric and also a freedom fighter. And, uh, it's very hard to separate clerics from the rest of the population because they're so integrated. John, I think there are, you know, there are. The, the church was in a difficult position, right? So I mean, the hierarchy early on, you'd say, you know, um, what, respected their agreement with the Ottomans around the order, but eventually that internal politics changes, and it changes because of again the resistance that's widespread, the external pressure that's coming. So the clerics from the diaspora are taking. A, a, a bit of a different view than maybe Constantinople's doing. Um, that's filtering through the merchant classes, it's filtering through back. And of course, you've got the village priest who is more representative or reflective of the popular view at the grassroots level, taking um, a more laico approach um, as circumstances change um, in those areas. And, uh, you know, villages are affected in different ways. Um, you know, some arbitrary reprisals. Others get organised to join the resistance and therefore the priest is a core part of that. And of course, the priests are often also the teachers of the communities passing on um, some of this knowledge of, of, of the past and identity. Um, uh, but eventually, uh, because of the reprisals against the hierarchy of the church, the church starts changing its, its position, but it can't formally change its position until there is a Greek state. And even now, you know, we're still working through, the patriarch is still working through what is its role in the success of the Ottoman Empire being the state of Turkey. You know, that's clearly still a problem, um, a problem there. But the, the, the clergy had one key role, but a lot of contradictions really uh, in, in where they were. Some, you know, don't, don't forget because they were also the tax collectors. They were, like any tax collector, you know, there is some 
fair negativity against the church, but also some unfair negativity. You know, um, even empires have to pay bills. And, um, you know... Spoken it, like a true politician, John. No, no, <laughs> all empires have to pay bills. And, you know, suddenly you're a citizen to pay taxes, but you don't have equal rights, you know. And so these contradictions also help assist. So, so here we are, identity, but our identity is not necessarily being recognised in the Ottoman Empire. The church is coming to collect our dues for the Sultan. And yet we can ask ourselves at the same time, well, what are our dues? It's our agricultural production. It's not money that we're used to now. It's predominantly our agricultural production is being shared by others. And yet when we've, we're in conflict, we have less rights. So these things bubble along as different things happen, uh, at, which again reaches that crescendo of 1822. And if you say that, you know, Southern Europe, I think, you know, why did, why did it happen in Southern Greece? You know, the rebellions all over the place. But why did it happen? You know, and I think it's just the nature of that peninsula. You know, it was, it was, it was the weakest link in the empire um, with Ali Pasha and him taking on, you know, the, the Ottoman Empire as well. Um, there was, was it more there was, homogenous there was, there, as there well? was that vacuum that allowed for the activists, the revolutionaries in Moria, Peloponnese, to then uh, be successful at some of their early, you know, at their, at their early battles around Mani Kalamata, Tripolitsa, etc. I'm going to go a step back and I want to talk about the Greek constitution. What was it, you, you mentioned it a couple of times, um, but I'll start with Dean. What was it influenced by? Well, the Greek constitution had absolutely nothing to do with the Greek people or their experience of government. It was a Western uh, derived constitution which uh, had much borrowings from the uh, French constitution of Napoleon and was also influenced by such people as Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson. There are elements in the first constitution, the first draft constitution, which talk about freedom of religion, the fact that all people of different religions will be treated equally at law, even though it was, they took pains to set out that the uh, prevailing religion of the state will be the orthodox religion. There's a clause in there which is very significant uh, that says that everybody uh, who is uh, of any other faith will be treated equally. And if you consider that at that time in 1821, you didn't have Catholic emancipation in England. That came in 1828, I think. It was, that was a very revolutionary concept. Um, that was a draft document. There were great ideals. But what you had in Greece were interest groups. And these interest groups were generally formed around the captains and, uh, and generals of the revolution who had their, all ba their own bands and who were squabbling for land and influence. And they generally followed the trajectory of what happened before, which was that the Ottomans, in order to govern each area easily within Greece, would assign a section of land to a captain and his, uh, and his men, and he could go there and police that for the Ottomans, and that was like their area. That was his posse, and that was his gang territory, if you like. So when the revolution finishes, and these people are still in charge, like the Afghan warlords, basically, I think that's a more apt uh, parallel. They were Afghan warlord type people. What happens is an Afghan situation. Each warlord needs to satisfy their followers and in order to do that you need land and plunder and you're vying for, uh, for resources and you're vying for influence. So the constitution is great but what's happening on the ground is, is far different. There's a great scene where the great hero of the revolution, Kolokotroni, uh, chases uh, Mavrokordatos, who was uh, a Constantinopolitan diasporan Greek, if you like. Well, not really diaspora, but he wasn't within the bounds of liberated Greece. Away and says, if you come here again, I will kill you. Uh, you, you pen-pushing so-and-so. So all this tension is happening, and the whole idea is, well, how do we govern ourselves when there has not been a Greek government of Greece for a very long time? And democracy is a great thing, but of course there's no universal franchise. Um, there are no rights for women. That, they're not even considered in the draft constitution, and that's fair enough. It was at a time when these concepts were still in their infancy. But was it fair? I mean, Bubulina was, and Mavrogenus, uh, like, well, Bubulina, that doesn't make sense. Bubulina and Mavrogenus were two women who were lionised by the Greek community and by, the, by Greek historiography and were treated deplorably. Bubulina was assassinated because her son had the temerity to uh, marry the, um, the daughter of a leading land baron on the island of Hydra. Mando Mavrogenus has uh, devoted all of her family resources to equipping ships for the Greek Revolution. Her love life 
was uh, paraded um, for all to see. She was, uh, it was, I'll call it, she was slut shamed, yeah? yeah. Um, made fun of, pilloried, degraded. Um, but all of a sudden, because she's up on our wall, she's a heroine of the revolution. And we haven't, uh, if you like, the Greek people have not in their history really come to terms with the terrible way that these women were treated. It's glossed over by calling them heroines. They were used, abused, and treated despicably. And of course, you have people like Marigosa Faropoulou, who no one's ever heard of, who was a spy in Constantinople, devoted all of her time, resources, and efforts in, because she had great cont uh, contacts and was the best schmoozer in the history of Greece, was able to provide valuable information to the Philkieteria and to the Greek freedom fighters, which saved a lot of them from death, including people like Papaflesas. And she was able to infiltrate the city of Tripoli, which was the first major city to be um, liberated by the Greeks and the terrible massacre of Muslims and Jews ensued, which we also don't talk about, but that's another issue, and, and betray the plans so that they can then go and liberate that city. No one knows her. And the only reason why we found out about her was in the 90s they discovered a petition that she had gotten some people to write for her saying, look, I've devoted my whole life to this revolution. I need a pension from the government. And she didn't get one because she died the same year. So the, these are the, if you like, untold dimensions. Yes, you have your, your document which confers formal equality, but what's happening on the ground is very, very different. But in terms of women, the constitution reflected the reality. That's what you're telling us. It did, because it didn't deal with them at all. Well, the, reali the reality of a very paternalistic society, you know, and so, you know, it's interesting how most traditional societies are paternalistic and, you know, and you'd still say, even in the Western world, paternalism still is there despite what we say about equality. So there's still a lot of fights, um, you know, have a look at how we treat, you know, female politicians in leadership positions versus to men, the totally different standards that we have. You talked about constitution. So what is a constitution? It's just an agreement about how to go and govern, right? Now, we, we know it now is about part of governing, but also about rights. All these things do evolve, like if you're going to have some continuous improvement. So eventually having succeeded, they need to have some rules that they're calling the first constitution in 1821, but it only lasts for a year. And the people that drew it up, who, who, who was that first assembly of the Greek parliament in Nafplio? You know, it was the landholders, the clefs and the domatoli, um, and, and the merchants. You know, they shared power between themselves. Yeah, okay, they resourced it, etc. Uh, but it was basically, you know, the oligarchs shared the position amongst themselves and they came up with a document that reflected them. It wasn't until 1822 where they actually, people, once, it, once it was drafted, there were these discussions saying, hey guys, you know, there's all the, you know, there's the French, there's the French Revolution going on. Where's liberty and uh, democratic principles in this? So it, it changed a bit in 1822, but it wasn't really until I think about 18, 1827 that um, that what we know as modern constitutions about people being treated equal um, was was in there. So so there was electoral reform there. It was much more democratic. Didn't have women. Had universal uh, uh, franchise. Um, but it also recognised for the first time in the Greek constitution around sovereign rights of individuals. Right? So it's the focus on the individual, not on who controls power and sharing the decision making in that. And of course there have been many constitutions since and despite that we also had a few, um, you know, we, we just went for, con for constitutional monarchies, we went for ignore the constitution to have dictatorships. So all these things are revolutionary again. I'll go to the audience. Does that change your perception of the Greek Revolution? Is this the ideals and the visuals that you have in your mind when you think of the Greek Revolution? I think John and Dean have given us a very comprehensive and convincing argument that the revolution did not occur because of one or two or three things. It was a huge number of factors that contributed. One thing that wasn't mentioned, perhaps, uh, was the fact that uh, empires in the history of, the, of humanity never last forever. I mean, we've seen the Byzantine Empire, the Roman Empire got down the drain, and even the superpowers that replaced that, even they are changing. China wasn't a superpower 30 years ago. All of a sudden, America has started to crumble. So 
that might be another factor that we need to add to the vast category of things that, you know, the timing uh, was an, another factor. But, but another important factor for me, because I was taught in Greek school in Greece, mm -hmm. so obviously my understanding of the revolution had the ethnocentric sort of elements that John talked about. And uh, I think that we now, it now is accepted by the rest of the world that Greece and Hellenism has contributed over thousands of years to civilization, to democracy, to concepts of freedom and philosophy and all the rest of it. Were there any remnants of that recognition at the time of the revolution that attracted the support, the external support, but also the support of people of Greek background who felt that their contribution ought to be recognized by uh, the Russia and, uh, the, uh, and, and England and other countries that supported us, helping Greece to, to be liberated. You know, in the same way that Greece was part of a consequence of the American Revolution, the French Revolution, you know, the Greek Revolution consequence was the formation of modern nation states. So, so even small places could, uh, that had strong local identity had the potential to be their own, their own nation state. So, so the empires weren't necessarily always the, the be all and end all. Um, you can you know, have a look at the you know, British Commonwealth you know, a lot of independent countries, but they're all still part of the Commonwealth. They've showed how you can evolve from empire to a different form of connection, which is still about relationships, economies, control, um, uh, whatever. Um, but I, did you know? Did the did the people in um, you know? Because I've got descendants, you know, from Manyaki and the Papa Flesses family. Did they did they know all these things? I doubt it very much. You're suddenly deciding when they're knocking on your door in the Chorio, um, There's going to be this battle. What are you going to do? You're either going to run or you're going to go and join and fight. And in the end, a lot of revolutions, so we just have a look at what's happening with the pandemic now. A lot of the protest is about motivate people to take a stand, right? Did we have anti-vaxxers here for this sort of stuff not long ago? No. Or all solid, you know, people that are really solid pro-vaxxers don't want to do anything with an anti-vaxxer. You force people to take a side. And when you've got a majority doing that, that are then supported by other powerful beings, then you're there. Let's have a look at the Taliban taking over control of Afghanistan. You can say that they've got popular support without, with, without, um, you know, without a vote, simply because they have prevailed. They prevailed against the Russians, they've prevailed again, uh, despite everything we try to do with them. And I think in decades to come, they'll be talking about that as a different type of revolution. You know, where is that going to go? You know, so in the Greek Revolution, yes, the first constitution wasn't the most democratic thing, but when you're all trying to fight for something common, and that's the only thing that's getting you together, and then you achieve that, you need to have another mechanism to sit down together and say what else is common, and what are the things we've got to go and resolve. We had two civil wars until we resolved that in 1829 because it meant that the fundamental differences about what we were fighting for were very different. And I think the big learnings are in that we had two civil wars from 1821 to 1829 until we actually had something better that the majority agreed on around some basic fundamental principles. So you're describing the same patterns in society that we see today. Nothing really changed. Dean? Well, while John was discussing that, and I think those points are extremely apt, I was considering this. Uh, we tend to see the Greek Revolution as something static. It happened in 1821. Um, it got to 1828 and 1829 with the two civil wars with the warlords fighting each other, uh, and that was it. But that's not the case. And once you're uh, embarked upon this idea that, well, you know what, we're going to create a nation state for X people, in this case the Greek people, where does that stop? And with the Greek nation, they were committed on this course for another 100 years because the world powers 
created a Greece which did not correspond with the democratic reality of the area. Most Greeks were living outside Greece. And there was that idea, that imperative, that well, we have to go and liberate these areas. Uh, a lot of which areas, especially in the north, were also occupied by other minorities, linguistic, uh, ethnic, and religious, that had a different view of their own nationality. And it was, and uh, either were pro or against being incorporated in the Greek state. And the Greek government was set upon this course of action for 100 years of incorporating these territories into their own, uh, into their own uh, borders. So that my great grandmother was born as an Ottoman citizen in northern Greece and she remembers the day that her city was liberated by the Turks. She was six years old. Uh, and, and what that was like to live under. So there are, there are different types of Greeks with different experiences. The people from the... Uh, the uh, southern Dodecanese islands were only liberated after the Second World War. They were colonized by the Italians. Um, it is questionable. It, it is, you can have a discussion about how free Cyprus is today and, and to what extent they should have been part of the Greek world um, and what happened there. That's, that's a completely connected but different issue. That will be the fifth episode. Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that will be the sequel, The Empire Strikes Back. But <laughs> did I tell a joke? I'm sorry. The, uh, and where does this end? And what do you do when there are competing interests and other people learn from the Greeks and say, well, you know what, what a great idea. Uh, we want our independence to the way that you've uh, gone about getting your independence. And by the way, we've been educated in your school, so thank you very much. But guess what? Our idea of where we should be living overlaps with yours and there's a conflict. And you have that conflict with Serbs, Bulgarians, Albanians. You have that, co that uh, conflict with urbanized Jewish populations in the north. Uh, and they didn't fare quite well out of the revolution either. All of these issues are things that need to be addressed if you're going to view the totality of the revolution and what it means. It was, in essence, yes, equal rights for everyone, but what that translated to in terms of facts on the ground was often very different and evolved over time. What did the Greek revolution mean then? What does it mean now? And what does it mean to us, Greek Australians? John. I think the lessons um, around, so what did, what did the different communities in what make up, you know, the place called Greece, at least southern Greece at the time because of the, you know, 1821, but they got free first, what was, what was happening on the ground? And I did say, you know, we've really underplayed um, on our national days the other, the other minorities that were supporters. And we need to understand that all good progress um, doesn't happen necessarily with one particular group, right? Good progress, you know, now we're most, most places in the world, at least the Western world, are multicultural societies now, in that, you know, in that sense. So you need to take different groups with you to, to succeed. But you can't do it on your own unless you have allies and other partners. So that's your Omoyenya, your diaspora, or your Philolines or in the modern world, you know, other, other, other powerful supporters as countries. If you're trying to get, you know, some, some, some global movement uh, or, 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 you know, if Greece is going to be successful at its geopolitical issues, which I think, you know, they've been getting better at in more recent times, is you need others to support you. Your vision has to fit in with an acceptable um, global vision. So that's actually a multicultural perspective. You know, we think of multiculturalism in Australia as the different ethnic groups that make up the country. But it really means about being um, outward thinking, respectful of other cultures and other views, and trying to see what are the things that marry us together as a majority. So when we've got multicultural, you know, why, why is multiculturalism acceptable and supported in Australia is because, again, we found a way where the mutuality of all of us with our difference is actually quite same in so many different areas. And so it's no different to why, you know, Greece got formed in the way that why we're, multiculturalism is acceptable to Australia. So commonalities bring success under, under, frame, under agreed frameworks, right? Doesn't mean you have, don't have problems. Of course, you can still continue to have problems because, you know, multiculturalism is still a concept. You know, different people have very different views about it. Those of us that have been practitioners you know, have a better understanding, but it's not a, you know, it's not a pure and perfect, um, um, a, 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 and, per, and perfect world. So, so for us over here, I think it's really, uh, there are still unresolved issues around the world, around nation building, 
Uh, what's our role as a country, as a multicultural in that? You know, I think we can play, Australia, because it's a multicultural country, can play a really good role in diplomacy around the world to show where, where differences, people that might otherwise see as differences and threatening, can actually be brought together and aligned to not be threatening and that difference is actually positive and not negative. Let me finish off on this point. So let's have a look, you know, we've got, you know, we've got a common challenge, you know, with what we historically see as an aggressive neighbour in Greece. I think it's useful, you know, so when I think of the Greek dictatorships and I see the, the public discourse that the diaspora had to end that dictatorship, to get countries supporting an end of dictatorship, even though beneficiaries like America were there, it happened because of that. And it was a good example that other countries can go and, can go and use. So if we, imagine if we had an empowered Turkish community that felt that having learnt around the rights, and I'll be, you know, maybe I'll be challenged as controversial, around the rights that we enjoy as a multicultural community in Australia, and it's actually healthy to be able to talk about a better future for our country of origin, or Cyprus, for example, I think that these are valuable things for us to do to be able to help motivate those countries to become better at what they are, to become part of what is the norm in a developed world, in a Western and modern world. Um, so, so I think they are some of the revolutions from Greece because we've kept on fighting. As Greeks, we kept on seeking improvement. It didn't end when the powers that be formally recognised us in 1832. Um, it just it continues on and we're struggling on that on the farcical supposed right to vote of the diaspora at the moment. So we can empower other communities to sort of think about how they challenge their own countries that have still been held themselves back for whatever reason. And countries do hold themselves back. We've held ourselves back around, you know, we're still having arguments about whether, what day to celebrate our national day. We're still having arguments about okay. how, you know, how confident we are as a nation when we're still holding on to the monarchy as if we, we're not brave enough to do something a bit different. You know, Greece at least was brave enough to get rid of the monarchy, but the, you know, the monarchy was uh, self-destructive and so it helped motivate the Greek public on all sides of politics to say no monarchy, but... <laughs> Dean, what do you think? I think that if we get rid of the monarchy, all of our magazines will fold overnight, so I'm definitely against that. It will harm the economy. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I struggle with this idea that Australia is a multicultural society. I've got questions about that. Um, to what extent do you call a country mono, uh, multicultural when there is a dominant discourse that treats everyone equally as long as you follow that dominant discourse and that's based upon the violent appropriation of land from its original inhabitants? I mean, the first thing we did when we came here tonight was acknowledge the traditional owners of this land. Well, in a sense, so that's what the Greek Revolution was about. It was about acknowledging the traditional owners of that land, who, by the way, were also dispossessed, uh, relocated, um, subject to genocide and subject to terrible things like one of the things that we learned, you would have learned at Greek school, is uh, the removal, forced removal of children, stolen generations, you know, the Janissaries. We've got a lot of comment. We, we, we contribute as Greeks to this society as a native people who were colonised and to whom similar things were done. So for me, we as a Greek Australian community are in a privileged position to be able to view the history of the first peoples of this country in a certain way with sympathy and with a certain amount of understanding. Okay? I think that's very important. Traditionally, our community hasn't done so because our focus has been on climbing a ladder which has been provided by us by a dominant culture and a dominant discourse that at that time preferred that we didn't discuss these things. Now, our discourse in this country takes place in English. There is formal, if you like, acceptance of multiculturalism being food and dances and chatting, but you have limited literature reaching the mainstream if it's not in, a, in, in what's called a community language and you have literal um, limited cultural permeation, okay? Now, take that and parallel that with Greece after 1828. What did the Greeks do? It was an almost similar thing. At that time, during the Ottoman times, because of colonisation and the fact that the uh, 
Ottomans violently appropriated the Greek land. They allowed all sorts of people to settle. Famously, the Jews in Salonika, they were kicked out of Spain. Uh, the Ottomans brought them and gave them a safe haven. They were in Smyrna. They made amazing contributions to the economy. There were movements of people going back and forth everywhere. And of course, one of the major things that we leave out of the narrative is the fate of the Muslim populations who were there for generations. Most of them were Greek speaking. Most of them had so much in common with their Greek neighbors. And by the way, what is a Greek? We've defined a Greek as a Christian tonight because that's been drummed into us from the beginning. But how do you have, how can you consider people who are uh, Muslim who've been living in the country for 300, 400 years who speak only Greek as not Greek? And uh, John alluded to this because they make you pick a side. So you develop a state, you create a state, you say this state is for us, and all of a sudden this multicultural reality becomes a monoculture. You, through the constitution, create a dominant discourse and you say this is for us. Yeah, we'll treat you all equally, but this is ours. We are, this belongs to us. And then what do you have? You have conflicts, you have effacement, and you have the slow erosion over a period of 200 years of the multicultural fabric of a society because that threatens your paradigm and the whole, uh, if you like, supposition behind the revolution and why you did it in the first place. And we only see that now, again, with the movement of uh, peoples because of economic political crisis, that that again is changing and Greece is struggling to deal with that. And we're struggling to deal with that here. I mean, how many debates did we have about immigration? So really it's about the revolution never really ends, like feminism. Feminism is an identity I hold very strongly, but I'm a fetus feminist. And I say that because I don't know so much and I'm always educating myself. And yeah, social change doesn't end when we say, you know, we have freedom now. What does that look? Campaigning is easy, governing is hard. Do you connect it at all with your Greek background? Or do you think that, that that spirit is there because of culture? Or is it just you? Totally. Um, you know, I think a lot of Greek young women would say, you know, their dads are the biggest supporters because it's this um, dichotomy that you live in where you have a very patriarchal family. So, you know, maybe gender roles, you see that with your yadas, theas, very patriarchal families. But then you have your dads and your parents and, you know, everyone around you. School, study, university, you know, where it's very then, um, yes, yeah, this identity, because, like, you know, they came to a different country. They wanted us, like, my papa and the others, so proud, like, about university. And that's a very shared experience that we have about education, about how proud they were for us to get educated. And that's not what was also reflected with the women in my life. We're always in a state of um, experiencing a revolution or, or the outcomes of the previous revolution has an impact on us and then we generate an, a cycle, another revolution. So I think it's always evolving and always in a state of being questioned um, and I'm excited to see where things will go in terms of what it means to be Greek women in Australia and the potential to kind of shake some of the foundations and and always I think the awareness has come to the forefront in the last few years and by being aware then you can see the injustices and point them out and, and engage others in the debate around you. I was lucky in a sense that my name's not too Greek therefore it wasn't a barrier for me in, in terms of getting roles. Um, my involvement with the Greek community has thankfully been a positive one but also frustrating at the same time because it does take a number of years to build up the trust, to build up the, the, you know, the relationships to be, to be seen and to be heard and to be acknowledged in, in that room. So, you know, it's, it's always common for me, whether it be in my working life or, you know, in work with the community to either be one of two or less females in the room and sometimes one of the younger ones as well, not so much lately, but you know, it's, it's, it's just something that I've had to deal with and work through rather than have to sit and lament about it and be like, no, you need to pay attention to me. It's always about just keep going forward um, and, and just continue, continue to go. I think so much of what you said really echoed with me. Um, I was actually born in Greece and came to Brisbane when I was six. So I grew up, my childhood was in Brisbane, so that's really a very Anglo culture and I was one of four 
Greek girls in um, in my high school. So I I think what you said too about I always felt not to stand out too much and try and um, not hide my Greekness but conform to uh, the dominant or mainstream culture as a way of fitting in and, and belonging. But at the same time I had the fortune of being able to visit Greece quite regularly throughout my childhood and, and connect with my um, relatives in Greece. So I, I really missed, or I was, that tension I really felt between wanting to be Greek but not being supported by my environment around me in Australia to, to do that. It's amazing how everyone talks about the, re the revolution and the progress that's been made, but it also sounds like revolution comes from oppression. And it's when you are oppressed that you look for an outlet. And that's when the revolution comes about. And through education, we seek to learn and become better as people and, and as a civilization. So through the women's uh, revolution, through the revolution of Greece and our our history, it's amazing that it's when we are being pushed down that we want to break out and reach for the skies and, and, and succeed. Have you felt oppressed in the Greek community? In Australia, I have, yes, very much so. Like you said, your name might not be as, as Greek. My name is Manoli and I was called Mike in primary school to assimilate. And my parents supported that because they were migrants who came to Australia. And it wasn't until I got to high school that um, I thought, no, my name is Manoli because my friends had various different names and I thought their name is unique, so is mine. And that's when I found my identity as a Greek and I speak up about that. So yeah, as a Greek I was oppressed and now I'm not. I, I don't know, my sort of take on the whole Greek Australian identity is one I'm sort of reworking every day. I don't think I have the typical outlook of what it is to be Greek and Australian and Greek Australian at the same time. But I do think that whole idea of living in two separate worlds that don't often overlap still exists. I have to be in one camp and then transport myself to the other. And I guess part and reason why I'm here today and you know, the people that are talking, the people that I sort of look up to and the things I'm always trying to learn every day is like, how can I build that middle ground? How can I build that, that functioning Greek Australian day to day? Because I think a lot of the success that we yet to have in language learning or cultural learning, history learning, is really like irrelevance. Like what's the relevance to it in our day to day? And I think the reason why a lot of people have the superficial understanding of Greece is because we live the Australian mainstream and we holiday to Greece. It's not really part of our day to day. But I guess my community involvement, the projects I tried to do, they are trying to make it relevant, trying to make it something we can work in every day. And I found that difficult. And I guess I am trying to experiment a bit to try and broaden the conversation what they might mean. I guess I'm less affected by the naming you know, um, uh, bits and bobs, that sort of thing. For me, it's more about like how I'm actually practicing every day of my life. And I think a Greek Australian norm is yet to come to fruition, a modern one. Parents started off in one mm. socioeconomic stratum, as a general rule, sure. and then their kids are hopefully slightly on a different level, not better or worse, and then the next generation again looks at things from a different vantage mm -hmm. point, which also gives the next generation uh, extra kudos, extra gravitas. There's a big difference between someone who's been a worker all their lives, which is a very noble job, versus someone who's got a position in the community that is more respected, thus they have the ear of the public more. The other thing I want to say to you is, and, and Manuel is right, when things are going well, people don't, there's no uprising because you don't care. Right? I, I came across some, a very good friend of mine now who's an actor in the Australian mainstream. Aussie guy, Anglo Kelly. And I invited him to the, um, to the Great Dinner Festival a couple of years ago. And we started off with the Rock of the Country. And he called me up the next day and said, I apologise about how stupid I was. So what do you mean? He said, I've been to so many functions, so many other things. Of course it was going to be a Greek that was going to do. The first time I've heard a Welcome to the Country at any foreign event, is you guys, because you understand the struggle. But notice the words that my esteemed friend uh, Leonidas has used. Foreign film event. Yeah. This is a Greek-Australian film event. We've been here for over 100 years. Yeah. But we internalise, and that, that's something that I wanted to make a comment about you, Christine, and the very, I think, profound observation that you made, which is why do certain Greeks think in stereotypes about who they are, leading them to clash with other cultures? And I think one thing that we need to understand is that, yes, you have this, um, if you like, baggage or compartmentalised set of values which are passed on to you by your parents, but you, who you are 
in another country is defined by the people who live in that country and see you as an outsider. So some of the time, and a lot of the things that you're actually living in your own experience, in your own home, and Dean made that point, sometimes on this, sometimes on that, and sometimes never the twain shall meet, is because of that. Sometimes you're playing to an externally imposed stereotype. Now, I mean, even the name we call ourselves as Greeks, I mean, that is a name that the West calls us and Australians call us. That's not what the name that we call ourselves. We always have that debate within the community, should we assert the right to be called by our own name, what we call ourselves? Suvlaki, uh, you know, Mykonos, we didn't bring that with us. Our parents were, and grandparents were too poor to have holidays. Most of them, my, uh, my mother remembers not having anything to eat, okay? We didn't bring these things with us. These were things that became popular here. That was how the West, how Australia saw us. Uh, and we played to that stereotype because it was a way of us being able to allow them to relate to us, okay? We need to um, tear apart the strands and see how much is inherited and how much is us responding to a stereotype by a dominant culture that wants to compartmentalise, wants, us, wants to define us in safe little boxes, and they don't only do it with us, they do it with all the other ethnic minorities as well, in order to govern us more effectively. So there's that. So, and, and, and Leonidas made that point when talking about the generation uh, and, and this idea of what being a Greek. What is a Greek and what constitutes a Greek Australian by extension is something that we've been trying to figure out since the time of Herodotus, who tries to define what a Greek is. Uh, and when Greeks come into contact with other cultures, such as the Romans, who were the first people that colonised Greece, that becomes a really important point. And then there's the idea that a Greek is a person who lives in a Greek way and has a Greek education. We spoke about education. But then you have class. Then you have what region of Greece you come from. You have what experiences you have, what part of Australia you live in, uh, what politics you espouse. There is no one Greek. And I think that interplay between what is a Greek, which is still being played out here, and what is an Australian, and then what is a Greek Australian, is I think one of the things which directly derives from this experience of a Greek revolution, the first time that it was decided we're going to create a nation, and what is that going to mean? You know, we've generated our own unconscious bias about who was in there as part of the revolution. Right? There are minorities that were, in, were part of the revolution, who, as I've said before, that now their ancestors are Greek citizens. As a community, we're quite comfortable now, right? You know, we're a professional business community. Our values are very different, you know. I mean, I, you, know, you know what side of politics I'm on. And I, I, get, I get concerned when people forget about their past, you know, their, their working class parents that relied on unions to become equal, to get equal pay to fight for safety in the workplace, that now everyone's doing okay and we can forget about the newcomers. I worry about that, let alone forget about dispossession in the past. The challenge is for us to highlight these commonalities like, like you ha have highlighted, because, you know, Dean's correct, you know, early, early Greek settlers, particularly out in the outback, you know, the Yakomos family, the, the Aboriginal is Justice Is that during the gold rush or that's in their 1900s? Yeah. And, 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 and even after, because, you know, for migration, you know, we, we, we weren't considered what we are now and we forget. You know, we still have racism against our community, but we forget what racism there was. And generally it was males that migrated. So if you cohabitated with someone, it was often minorities uh, went towards, you know, uh, uh, or worked with Aboriginal communities. That's who they are, felt some identity with. And we need to go back and remind ourselves and celebrate all these early connections. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, John. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. This was our first Think Greek. Tune in next week for Think Greek Women, the women of the revolution. I'm Kyriakos Gold. Kalinichta. Forget about any man trying to get a board position these days. They're all going to the women, and I know that's rubbish. I'm not, um, you know, a woman of colour or an Asian woman or, you know, identity. Like, I'm, you know, you fit a particular thing. Does, is that bothering me? No. It really makes me want to shrink back and go, how have I contributed to that behaviour and what have I done to change that behaviour? I think around the world, even for the people that they came here in Australia as uh, for a better life, they were looking for opportunities. So I think it's a very important word. Multiculturalism was built uh, with the premise of a, a utopia. 
I think it's cool to be Greek today. A lot of <laughs> Greek women are really proud of their identity and they're really, really good.